Hey guys, welcome back to Chatting with D. Today I got a chance to interview the writer, the activist, the poet, the journalist, Felipe Luciano. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and let's get started. Chatting with D is where you need to be. Felipe Luciano, thank you so much for coming onto my show. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. It's, very happy to be here. It's such an honor to have you on here, and it's such a, a full circle moment within our family. Well, it's an honor for me to be here. First of all, to see you. I remember when you were born. <laughs> I remember when your mother was a little girl running around this house wanting to be in the business. I know your father. I've known him for 40 years. Um, so for me, this is family. I come here and I feel so much at home. I wonder if we're related by blood because I feel so close to your mother and father, so close to your, um, well, your grandparents, Ralph Mercado uh, and, and his family. And I am enamored um, of the humor, the vitality, the, the intelligence of his family. You guys have done very well. And a, lot of, a lot of you have gone into the business. I'm very happy to see that. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's so much history to unfold here. And I, I'm excited to get into it and get started. So let's start on your upbringing. You were born in East Harlem. Talk about how it was like living in New York City back in the day. Let me begin by telling you that um, Africa is my mother. Puerto Rico is my father. I was raised to be proud of being a black Puerto Rican. I never had a problem uh, denying my, who I was. My grandmother was a black Puerto Rican who used to have me on her lap for hours. Um, not enough can be said about grabbing a child and touching them all the time, telling them they're beautiful. She told me I was the prettiest nigga she had ever seen in all her life. And I grew up thinking like that. Your mother tells me, you think you all that, but you know what, that's the way you grow up. When you grow up thinking you're pretty and knowing you're pretty, um, very few things can knock you down. So I grew up with the sense of beauty and purpose and elegance and values. I grew up uh, in East Harlem at a time where there were gangs, dope fiends, uh, and music. I grew up around Johnny Pacheco and the Pachanga, Tito Puente and the Mambo, Celia Cruz, Ray Barreto, Eddie Palmieri, Machito, all of those, that music I grew up in. Uh, and many of the guys who have became superstars were living around the corner. I didn't know this, but they were right there. Joe Cuba was right there. I'm from 112th Street. Eddie Palmieri's from 112th Street. I'm from 112th Street. Willie Bobo's from 112th Street. So I grew up enmeshed in, in Latin music, enmeshed also in violence. Uh, the Viceroy's were a gang that controlled East Harlem at that time, mainly black Puerto Ricans. The Dragons were from 106th Street down. They were lighter skinned Puerto Ricans. It was a strange mixture of, of spirituality, violence, um, and extreme love. Everyone knew one another. There was a code. And so I grew up with a code. And the code was, I don't care what you do. You can be a dope fiend, you can be a, a drug dealer, you can be a number runner, you can be a pimp. Always respect the elders, always. Always respect the women of your family. Always respect the women of your friends. You don't fool around with other people's women. Not because it's wrong, but because you could die. Very simple. These are the things I grew up in. It's so sad to see so much of that culture, Puerto Rican culture, uh, is being lost today. Did I grow up with racism? Yes, I did. White Puerto Ricans in those days were horrible. They would not allow you to marry a dark man, and even less if he was a black American. But if you were a black Puerto Rican, it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I grew up Pentecostal, which means I was raised almost in the Yoruba tradition. They don't like to admit that. But the reality is, is that Pentecostalism is so much like Orisha, like Santeria, uh, as almost to be unreal. They believe in divination, they have prophecy, they, they dance in the spirit, it's the same thing. Only the white man has deemed Santeria wrong. I grew up playing drums. I grew up loving music. I saw Frankie Lyman in the Teenagers for the first time. On 112th Street and, and um, 3rd Avenue. It was a lovely time to be growing up, a lovely time to be um, involved in cultures. And finally, I am now an internationalist because I was raised with Italians, Sicilians, um, and Jews. In those days, East Harlem had 100,000 Jews. Everywhere you went, there was an Orthodox Jew. I grew up knowing the rituals of Judaism. To this day, 
I follow uh, Judaism as a culture and I lecture on it. I think everyone should take a culture and study it. I grew up among black people, black people from the South. And I learned that there's a elegance about black people in the South. There's a richness to their culture. I grew up with Italians, Sicilians, who are serious folks. You can't fool around with them. I can go into any community in the city and I either know somebody or at least know their culture so that I can be accepted and we can begin to communicate. You cannot tell me that you are not a racist uh, if you do not have people of different cultures in your family group. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, no, no, I have no, I, I have no problem with color, but I don't see you with black friends. I know a lot of Puerto Ricans who talk about, oh, we all together. They don't have one black friend. Mm -hmm. I know Puerto Ricans who, 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 who just, not porque nosotros nos llevamos con los negros. You don't get along with no black people because I don't see black people in your house. Do you know what it is to have butter beans and neck bones? Do you understand what that's about? Do you know the difference between good uh, cornbread and bad cornbread? Do you understand what it is to have jerk chicken? You know what I'm saying? You got to know what it is. Yeah. And if you haven't read, uh, if you haven't eaten the food, smelled the smell, gone to church with them. I, I've gone to shul I don't know how many times. I'm very, very familiar and comfortable in, in, a, in, a, in a Jewish uh, tabernacle. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable in a Muslim tabernacle. I grew up with Muslims. Yeah. Come on. It's a wonderful thing to have this kind of cultural, and I wish all New Yorkers had it, so that we could avoid the kinds of conflicts we have in the world. But it also comes from that respect point, which you were mentioning before. And it's good to have that respect point because then you will know exactly how to navigate throughout the cultures and um, be more aware of it all. From that, from everything that you've seen in your childhood and your upbringing, you became a member of The Last Poets. And from there, you were leading a movement that was dedicated to African-American consciousness. Can you talk to us about that journey and what it was like to create The Last Poets? It was a difficult time growing up, but I began to understand that there was injustice in the world. Though I believed in a meritocracy, I used to read the stories of Eisenhower, of Patton, of Albert Schweitzer, of all of these great people, and I said, I want to be like them. I didn't believe that intelligence uh, meant that you couldn't be a warrior. I believed in being a warrior. You should be smart, you should be able to fight, you should be a man. Um, warrior, love, a scholar, those are my three words. I believe in them, warrior, love, a scholar. You don't mess with family. That's the first thing you have to understand about Puerto Ricans. I wish black people had that. I wish black people understood you do not mess with black children. We've had too many children killed, and we're gonna have to, at some point, decide that we're gonna defend our own. I believe this to be true. Of course, I went to jail, and when I came out, I was already prepared for revolution. Jail had got me to a point where I wasn't afraid of anything but God. I needed to do something in between. They told me that there was a group of poets. I didn't know I could write. I didn't even know I was that smart. I knew I could speak well, and that was it. But I went to 125th Street, and there was a guy named Guylin Kane, who was in the loft, and he asked me what, was, what did I want, and I said I had been told that there was a group here called The Last Poets, and I'd like to join them. He said, do you, do you know anything about poetry? I said, no. He said, do you know anything about carpentry? I said, yes, I lied. Um, he said, well, we need somebody to build a kind of a framework, a kind of a door on a stage. Can you do that? I said, sure. I lied again. But I did anything I could to get on, into that group. Hanging out with the last poets, I eventually um, acculturated myself. Through osmosis, I began to understand the language of words, the artistry of words. I became a wordsmith. And I began to uh, write and write and write until I became an official member of the last poets. We traveled all over the country. And the first poem that I wrote 50 years ago was a poem that's still considered the standard to this day. Wherever I go, this is the poem that they remember. New York, Deaf Poetry, please give it up for Mr. Felipe Luciano. Jíbaro! Mi negro lindo! de los bosques de caña, caciques de luz, tiempo es una cosa cómica. 
He baro. My pretty nigga. Father of my yearning for the soil, the land, the earth of my people. Father of the sweet smells of fruit in my mother's womb, the earth brown of my skin, the thoughts of freedom that butterfly through my insides. Hibaro, my pretty nigga. Sweating bullets of blood and bed bugs swaying slowly to a softly strummed five string guitar, remembering ancient empires of sun gods and black spirits and things that were once so simple. How times have changed, men. How men have changed time. Unnatural, screams the wind. Unnatural. Hebaro, my pretty nigga man. Fish smells and cane smells and fish smells and cane smells and tobacco and oppression makes even God smell foul. As foul as the bowels of the ship that vomited you up on the harbor of a cold metal city to die. No sun, no sand, no palm trees. And you clung to the slimy rib of an animal called the marine tiger in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hebaro. Did you know you my nigga? I love the curve of your brow, the slant of your baby's eyes, the calves of your woman dancing. I dig you. You can't hide. I ride with you on subways. I touch shoulders with you and dance. I make crazy love to your daughter. Yeah! You my cold nigga man. And I love you because you mine. And I'll never let you go. I will never let you go. You mine nigga. And I'll never let you go. Forget about self. We're together now. And I'll never let you go. Mm-mm. Never, nigga. That was a beautiful poem. And thank you for sharing that with us. And would you say that you kind of found your passion for poetry through The Last Poets? Yes, yeah. I can say that. Victor Hernandez Cruz, one of the greatest Puerto Rican poets, uh, was the one who led me into poetry. And was the one who suggested I go visit, I was on 102nd Street at the time, I had just come out of jail, and he suggested I go to visit this guy, and I did, and I became a member of The Last Poets. We traveled all over the country. Poetry is the highest literary form there is. There's nothing higher, not, not novel writing, not prose. Poetry is the finest, finest mechanism by which you can express yourself in words. It's wonderful. So I began to write about revolution as well. I was incensed at what I saw was happening. It was 1968 the Democratic Convention. The Panthers were having problems. They were being killed left and right. Fred Hampton was being sought after and eventually murdered. Malcolm, Martin, the Kennedy boys, on and on it went until I realized I had to get beyond poetry. The poetry is what led me to revolution. It demanded that I do something. And real poetry does that. You can't just say things. What do you do? Yeah, the action behind it. That's right. So what I did is I joined a group called La Sociedad de Albizu Campos. I didn't want to in the beginning because I didn't think they were ready. I didn't think Puerto Ricans were ready for armed struggle. And I believed in armed struggle and still do. If it comes time for us to revolt, if it comes time, let us do it with all of our might and all of our strength. The only way you answer the boys who invaded the Capitol on January uh, 6th is to go after them. 
and let them know we are, you want to play this game? Are you sure you want to do this? I joined this group. We morphed from a student group into the organization called the Young Lords Organization, which was a Chicago organization yep. led by a gentleman, a phenomenal gentleman named Chacha Jimenez, who was mentored by Fred Hampton. And the rest is history. We took over a church. Uh, we had gone to the middle of East Harlem and told the church, we need space. Now, understand, I was raised Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, am I a socialist? Am I a revolutionary? Most definitely. We asked them to please let us uh, deliver breakfast programs, breakfast program to uh, breakfast foods to our kids. He said no. So for seven weeks, we tried to convince him to let us have his stove because his stove was the biggest in the community, and we could uh, we could uh, repartir, we could distribute um, breakfast to our kids. He didn't want to do it. On the seventh uh, week that I had gone there. Uh, it was Testimonial Sunday, and I got up to speak to the congregation. I was, had been elected chairman of that student group that I talked to you about. And when I got up, 22 cops jumped up, and they beat me pretty badly. Now, I've been beaten by police. Um, this was a beating that was painful. I wanted to die. I remember thinking if I could just go to sleep, but when that voice tells you to go to sleep is when you must stay up because consciousness is ebbing. So I was slipping on my own blood. That's how much blood was coming down. They eventually arrested us. And within a few days, they let us go. But they had broken my arm in two places and they had, I had about seven to 14. I can't remember how many stitches in my head. They thought we were gonna stop. We waited a week. The next week, when the cop cars were away from the church, we took the church over with locks and chains and began to serve breakfast there. That was a shot heard around the world. Everybody came to that church. We only had it for 11 days. Donald Sutherland came, Jane Fonda came, Pete Hamill, Jose Torres, Herman Badillo, Arnie Segarra, the mayor's aide. At that time, he was um, Mayor Lindsay. Evelina Antonetti, one of the great tenant leaders mm -hmm. of uh, the South Bronx. Everybody and his mother came. Uh, and we were able to put ourselves on the map through that people's church, we call it. Interestingly enough, 50 years later, I'm a member of that church. 50 years later, um, I'm always there helping the new pastor out. We call it the people's church. It took us 50 years. But there's a breakfast program in every school in New York City. It took us 50 years. Then we had another problem in terms of the health of our children. When we ask the people, the older people in the community, what do you think is the major problem in our community? They said garbage. I couldn't believe it, I wanted to walk out. Garbage, that's the problem? That's what revolution is about? They said yes. You must listen to the elders. You must not think that you have the answers. When we found out that it was garbage, that that's what they really wanted, we started sweeping up the streets, bagging it and putting it on a corner. The sanitation department would, the department would not come and pick it up. So we left it there, and eventually, when we realized that they were not gonna pick it up, we put it in the middle of the street. Now, the way New York City works is if traffic doesn't move, neither does the money, because that's how they make their money, from the buses and the cabs, and, and uh, we threw that stuff right in the middle of the street. And when they came to pick it up, we would set fire to it. That means there were three city agencies that were being used yeah. um, for overtime. A, the sanitation department, be the police and the fire department. So they decided, why don't we just pick up the garbage? It's easier, and they did. That was another victory we had. Then we had a problem with TB testing. We, we didn't know this, but a lot of our people were suffering from tuberculosis at that time. The TB truck was going around to all of the neighborhoods in New York as a portable system, but they weren't coming to East Harlem. So we saw them in another area of New York. We took over the truck and brought it to East Harlem. <laughs> the next thing we did, is decided to um, take over a hospital. Now here's where I assumed that we would probably lose our lives. Um, taking over a hospital is like taking over a police station. It's a city-owned uh, facility. You just don't go in and take it over. We took it over because we said too many people were dying. Too many people were being used as guinea pigs. Too many people were not in the administrative higher echelons of Lincoln Hospital. 
we took it over. Uh, we got what we wanted. Eventually, they built a hospital. Um, they came in crashing, thinking that we were going to stay there. We left. We, we escaped with our lives. Lincoln Hospital today is a new hospital. So those are the things we did. Eventually, we broke up for any number of reasons. A lot of them, uh, the result of COINTELPRO, which was a government program uh, initiated by FBI to create dissension within the group. They'll put people in who speak Spanish, put people in who are black, they'll put people in who you think are revolutionary. They did this to the Panthers too. Uh, and they'll begin to create dissent within the party. We made history, not because we wanted to, but because they wanted us to. Because if they had not allowed us to do what we wanted to do, we would have gone along with it very nicely. But they didn't, they didn't listen. As most states don't. You have to fight and sometimes you have to die. Our problem is that as Puerto Ricans, um, we still think that things are going to come easy. We want the independence of Puerto Rico, we're gonna to have to fight for it. Uh, Frederick Douglass said, nothing comes without struggle. You gotta fight for it. Albizu Campos fought for it. Uh, he said, the land is valor and sacrifice. We still don't understand that. I believe that Puerto Ricans have within them the rage, the intelligence, the strategy, the courage to take Puerto Rico. We have to believe that we can raise our own food, feed ourselves, take care of our schools. We have it. We have the most fertile land in the Caribbean. Why are we not doing it? We're afraid that if we lose the relationship with the United States, that we will starve to death. And what they put in front of us is, do you see what happened in Santo Domingo? See what happened to the, the Dominican Republic? See what's happening to Cuba? See what's happening in Venezuela? That could happen to you if you leave us. It's like an abusive husband. Baby, if you leave me, who you gonna have? Who gonna take care of you and your kids? You better never, and smacks a bang, gives them more kids and doesn't pay for them. That woman is terrified. It's a battered wife syndrome. I say get past that. First of all, he puts his hand on you again, kill him. But on top of that, move out and do what you need to do. Uh, better to be free. But I believe a black man in this country who is not paranoid is a sick man. You must always be watchful, always watch, always be careful of what you say, how you say it. And so I predict that America will have a civil war. These people are not gonna let go. They're not gonna give up their white skin privileges. They're not going to give up institutional racism. We're gonna have to fight for it. And if it destroys this country as we see it now, so be it. But what we will come up with will have to be a different place, a different thing, a different idea. We cannot continue this way. After I left the Lords, I went into radio. Uh, I didn't know how much I loved, well, I knew I loved music. I didn't know how much I loved music. I started at RVR. I had always been at BAI with the Young Lords, which is a nonprofit station. And I started a program called Latin Roots. Little did I know that I knew more about Latin music than most people did. So I started from 12 midnight to five in the morning. I began to do that with my then wife, Nancy Rodriguez, my son's mom, and we killed it. For three years, that place was popping. You, on Sundays, it was on Sundays from 12 to 5, you could not hear any other music on that day. No matter what, it, everybody was tuned to WRVR. Uh, I would play their records incessantly. And I played them and explained the rhythm, the arrangement, the texture, the context, the history, until people understood why it was important for them to listen to these people. Not to mention that the music in and of itself was wonderful. Eventually people picked up on it and the kids began buying those records. 
And I think we would be able to single-handedly revive the Latin industry because of that one program. Frankie Crocker, who was at that time a very big DJ on WBLS, came over to me and said, I'd like you to work for my program. And I went there for a while uh, and enjoyed it. Black radio is a trip. It is wonderful. I, and he used to play Latin music every once in a while. He told me not to play Latin music. I used to slip it in once in a while. From there, I was told that NBC was looking for a reporter, a Latino reporter. And when I went there, the gentleman who was in charge of hiring, uh, I knew just from his attitude that he didn't like me and didn't want me on. First of all, I was a black Puerto Rican. They wanted a Latino, they said. But you know what they were thinking of. Fair skin, straight hair, that kind of stuff. And along comes this Negro, you know, militant too. And they said, no, nah, I don't think we have, I don't think it's gonna work. And the guy refused me for th three times. Eventually, I got the job. Uh, immediately after that, I, uh, from then on, I went on to win two Emmy Awards. Took care of business, I loved reporting. I got bored though, terribly bored. Because reading the news, I became an anchorman believe it or not. And I would get on the air and talk and, and hear the news. How much can you do that before you're bored to tears, especially if you're an artist? I decided to call up a station, any station. I called up Channel 2. And I said, hey, um, are you guys looking for reporters? And they said, who's this? I said, Felipe Luciano. They said, we've been looking for you for two years. Wow. And got another job and got another Emmy for what I did. And then I went back to radio, and what I've been doing now is writing, poeting, lectures. I did a year at Fordham University. I love teaching college. I love it. And right now what I'm doing is finishing my book, because I think it's important. It's called Flesh and Spirit, The Revolutionary Path, and giving people a sense of what happens to a young man as he makes a decision to make his life valid. As a young Afro-Latino making strides within your community, how did the relationship with my grandfather come about? How did you guys meet? How did you guys become friends? And then eventually, family. Ralph Mercado was the Bill Graham of Latin music. You couldn't do anything in this business without him. He was the booking guy. He was the producer. And if you wanted a group, you had to go to him. In the Young Lords, we used to go to him and ask him for things, and he would give it to us. We would go first to the leaders of the... Um, bands, and then they would say, we got to talk to Ralphie about it, and then we talked to Ralphie about it. I got to know him because through radio, um, I did some of his commercials for Madison Square Garden, for other things. Uh, I did concerts for him, I emceed for him. I saw something in him that was very tender. I saw something in him that was vulnerable. I also saw his drive. He was an incredible man. No matter what happened the night before, he was there. And he had to deal with a group of multiple personalities who were, I think, schizophrenic. Our community was, we had mental problems, we had drug problems, we had ego problems, and he had, was able to handle it all. I don't know how he did it. So I began to begrudgingly admire him. He's a black man who's doing his best to keep this music going. What happens, who are you gonna replace him with? I realized that the burden of a black man who does something new, remember he was doing something new, and the, uh, the amount of stress that it imposed on him. Just to give you an example, I would see him do a contract with Madison Square Garden for 22,000 people, the Fania All-Stars, and get no money. He had to put up his own money to keep the house uh, solid, to put a down payment, and then wait for the people to come in before he could pay them and his staff. The tension of that is enough to drive anybody crazy. Since Puerto Ricans are late buyers, they're late ticket buyers, they buy at the last minute. So he'd have to wait until the night of the concert for him to get his money. I don't know how he did it. But I admired him very much. He brought salsa all over the world. Yeah. All over the world. Many say that when he passed away, salsa passed away as well. In many ways it did because he kept it going. He kept it on radio stations, 
He kept, and he drove me crazy, by the way. That's the way it was in those days. But he revolutionized the world. Today, whether you go to Bulgaria, Japan, Romania, or China, Ralph Mercado is the reason salsa music is heard. Yeah. And I want to go back to the point where you said that you don't know how he did it all, but I think that he did it because he had such a beautiful soul, and he did it from love, and he did it from the fact that he saw how music can bring everybody together, no matter what the circumstances were. Yeah, and he had been doing that for years. Yeah. He brought black and Puerto Rican culture together in yeah. this city. Mm -hmm. In the three-in-one club, he did that. Um, and at the Hotel St. George, he would have on one floor, he'd have um, James Brown, the Shy Lights, uh, or Blue Magic, and then on the next floor he had La Lupe and Eddie Palmieri. I mean, go figure. How do you bring those two cultures together and bring both crowds together? And he did it all the time. He lived in both cultures, which is what I love. He never denied his blackness. That's what I loved about him, too. Yeah. He was a black man. Mm -hmm. But he did open up the world, oh my God, to Latin music. That's Ralph Mercado. Uh, funny, uh, his laugh was infectious. When he laughed, you had to laugh. He was a wonderful man. He used to take me out to eat. And uh, he liked he liked taking out his money. <laughs> he would go like this, they got a roll, and pay it like this. Oh, I admired him so much. I thought he was great. And he wasn't a gangster. He was not a gangster. I wish he had been, but he was not. You know, he was very vulnerable, a very tender man in his own way. Very tender. Now remember the pressure it takes to pull off these concerts and these business dealings, the pressure. And by the way, he died of a brain of a, a brain aneurysm. And I think a lot of that, the pressure of that, uh, is what eventually um, took him down. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for sharing your story with him. And you know, I'm sure he's looking down upon us now, and is just happy that we're together here as a family, and and just continuing um, talking about his legacy and the legacy that you guys had together as well. Well, his spirit is in his house. I feel it. Yeah. And I hope that we can all one day be as great as he was in building institutions, because that's what we need to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Last question, what advice do you have for the youth trying to make it in journalism, trying to become an activist, trying to become a poet, life advice, anything that you have, you can say it right in. My advice to all students, all Latinos, who want to move into whatever field you want to, is be intellectually curious. Too many of us are not reading. We do not read for revelation. We read to pass an exam, read, travel, learn another culture so that you can understand the underpinnings of a culture. What is your mind about? Where are you coming from? The reason Trump was able to get over on many people is because people didn't read. They weren't reading. If you had read the Constitution, you would know that what he was doing was illegal and you would have stopped it yourselves but you didn't know. Stop the cult worship. Do not believe that what a person says is what he means. Dig into him or her. We have a long road to hold here. And I believe that the next president within my lifetime will be Latino. At some point, there will be a Latino president. How are you going to help the cause? What are you going to do? How is it that we allow children of Mexican immigrants, Central American uh, immigrants, to be taken from their mothers and stripped, and we haven't done anything about it? We have not been invading those centers. If it was up to me, we'd be invading, unlocking the chains as we did in the People's Church, and grabbing those kids and bringing them to Puerto Rican mothers who can take care of them. Hay viejitas ahora mismo que necesitan esos nietos. Let's give them to the old ladies who really, the, the senior citizens, who need to have a child. We need to do more than talk nonsense. Education is important. Do not believe those dream killers who say, ah, tú no necesitas la escuela. What do you need to go to school for? I can make more money on the streets. It's a lie. Education 
is revolution. Reading is revolutionary. Doesn't mean that you can't shoot. Doesn't mean you can't buy a gun. It doesn't mean that you can't join a political party. But support those who are supporting you. And that means you stand on those streets when people ask for demonstrations and you demonstrate. And never be afraid to stand up for what you believe in. I believe in Puerto Rican independence. You may not, but at least give me the opportunity to discuss it with you. Let's discuss how we can make our country great. Puerto Rico is a fantastic country, and I believe that what we need is independence. Que viva Puerto Rico Libre. Thank you so much for coming on to my show. Oh, it has been Thank your mother. Just an honor to be able to sit here with you and, and listen to your journey and just talk about everything <laughs> from when you were first in Harlem uh, to where you are today with the radio show and all of the great trial and tri trials and tribulations that you've done in between. Thank you for always just putting our community welcome. first and, and I wish you all the best and well, thank, thank you, you again. Just pr you pray for me and I'll pray for you. Yes. <laughs> but thank your mom too. Your mom has been my sister for many, many years mm -hmm. and I adore her and I adore your dad. So whatever they want me to do, I'm always there for them.